Ava Santina, hello. Ollie Dugmore. How are you? Well, you know. Fantastic. Tough day down the salt mines. Always. Uh, let's react to some Prime Minister's questions clips. Let's. We're in the middle of a housing crisis with mortgages soaring, rents rising and house building set to a post low. And just last week, with an interview with the Conservative Home, the Prime Minister admitted his disastrous decision to drop housing targets to appease Tory party members. Can the Prime Minister please explain to the House why the views of a thousand members are more important to aspiring homeowners um, families across the country? So, that was the first question to the Prime Minister. That one just precedes the Keir Starmer, Rishi Sunak. I can't even call it a showdown. It was so... <laughs> like two toddlers <laughs> fighting over a dummy. Yeah, quite. That was Labour's Abana Apongasare. And she is... Well, actually, that confused me because this is so boring, but I thought she'd be sitting on the front bench because she's the shadow exchequer to the Treasury. Mm. So I don't know why she was sitting where she was. Anyway. She got to ask a question anyway, didn't she? Yeah. Talking about housing target, mm. targets, which Rishi, Rishi Sunak, last week in an interview with Conservative Home, said he was not planning to meet because local people did not want house building in their area. Shock. It's just like, it, nimbyism is a cancer, isn't it, in our, in our society. It's, I, I don't understand how you resolve the housing crisis without building more homes. And as long as you permit, okay, so this, this is an interesting parallel, right? If the government, when the government wants to re -ho -ho home house asylum seekers, they do so unilaterally. They put them into hotels, they put them into army bases, they're going to put them into a barge. And as followers of politics, Joe will know that uh, we have a particular interest in Richard Drax, MP, and he could be bothered to get off his ass and say something for once. And it was in opposition to a barge containing asylum seekers being parked in his constituency. Nothing to say about the fact that the two, two biggest towns in his constituency have like been identified as having some of the worst social mobility in the country. Nothing about that, but the fact that there might be some refugees might be some refugees in a boat outside. Yeah, big fucking deal. Because it'll him. hurt the house prices. Yeah, exactly, it'll hurt the house prices. But this is the point. They're more than happy to override local concerns. And I'm not saying, by the way, that those local concerns are founded. But what I'm trying to point at is the hypocrisy of they'll make that decision unilaterally. But when it comes to building homes for the people in the constituency that need somewhere to live, they're like, no, local, local, local people have to be respected. Yeah. We have to empower them to make decisions. And I think it's, it's just deeply hypocritical. Yeah. They, um, well, Michael Gove said in December, well, he basically admitted that they weren't planning to meet their manifesto pledge of building 300,000 new homes a year. And they also fell something like nearly 20,000 homes short of target by the end of 2021, which is huge. That's mm. a huge number because that 300,000 pledge isn't actually enough to keep up with demand as it is. So all you're seeing is homes are going up in value because there's not enough supply to meet the demand. And who benefits? The wealthy. The asset class, yeah. Mm. Tory voters. Another nice. clip. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, here's a record. We're cracking down on grooming gangs, and he's, he's uncomfortable, Mr. Speaker, he's uncomfortable addressing. We toughen the law on sex offenders so they spend longer in prison. He voted against it, Mr. Speaker. And we've increased rape convictions by over 60%. Meanwhile, he, meanwhile, he, he attended, he attended 21 sentencing council meetings that water down punishments. That's why they call him Sir Softy. Soft on crime, soft on criminals. Yeah. Mr Speaker, I prosecuted thousands upon thousands of sex offenders. He's just shown he doesn't understand how the criminal justice system works. No wonder he can't fix it. Yeah. Richie Sunak addressing that the Tories have increase the conviction rate for rape by 60%, which is extraordinary. Must be a huge number, Ava. Yes, well, actually, Ollie, <laughs> sit down. <laughs> um, of all rapes reported, 1% of those are carried through to conviction. 1%. And 60% of 1% is 0.6%, which means the rape conviction rate is 1.6%. Hot. That's huge. I mean, that's brilliant. Personally, if a I round was, of applause yeah. for Rishi Sunak. Yeah. Fuck me. 
Extraordinary stuff. Well done, Prime Minister. Mm. Well done, Prime Minister. I mean, that that is just such willful, um, like willful deception ab- around the actual this because that is like one of the biggest, if not the biggest. There are many um, problems with the criminal justice si- system that rape effectively goes unpunished. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's atrocious, right? And for him to be lording up his government's achievements on that is sickening. Sickening. Um, also, can we have? Do you want to talk about Sir Softy? Do you want to? Do you want to, do you want to talk about that? I quite like the idea of the advisor out the back who wrote that, being like, "Yes, you got it in." It's like when two, two children, and not in in an endearing way, where you think, "Oh, that's cute." They're having an argument. It's like when two children in a playground are trying to insult each other, but they don't have the vocabulary just yet. That's really good. Do you know? Do you know what I mean? It's like. You're soft. Well, no, you're silly. Yeah. You're weak. Your mum can't the, convict rapes. <laughs> These are two of the most, apparently, senior men in the country. Two, two people who apparently are deserving of leading the country. And one's like, you're so softy. And the other one's like, you do sticking plaster politics. Mm. Could, you, could you imagine being in a pub? And some, <laughs> that was like an insult someone threw out there. <laughs> we fucking laughed out Mr. the door. Softie. Yeah. yeah. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I'm, I'm delighted to hear that they had an equally, I'm delighted to hear that they had an equally peaceful and relaxing Easter break as I did. <laughs> Mr. P- Prime Minister, Prime Minister, was it their refusal to stand alongside striking workers on the picket line, their acceptance of the economic damage being caused by Brexit? or perhaps their support for denying the people of Scotland the right to choose their own future, which led to the leader of the Scottish Conservative Party urging voters to back Labour. Ah. Well, Mr Mr. Speaker, what we're doing is not getting distracted by the things that are going on elsewhere, and we're focused on delivering for the people of Scotland. I thought that was the best that Stephen Flynn could do, actually. That was a terrifying proposition that he had to stand up during PMQs today when a couple of his SNP colleagues have been arrested over the past few weeks and the party seems to be in turmoil and Rishi Sunak basically had a wealth of insults that he'd be able to hurl back at Stephen no matter what he said so I actually thought he did quite well there. Yeah me too I guess you kind of you nip it in the bud don't you by take you take the words out of his out of his mouth with a gag so that he can't I I quite like Stephen Flynn. I think mm. he's funny. Um, I think he's quite witty. I think he does well in these exchanges. He always seems quite calm. Um, he's often, the, without saying a single thing about the policies of the SNP and just talking about the sort of charisma of the people involved, I like the way that he speaks to Rishi Sunak. I th- there's almost, you, you sort of, the obvious comparisons between him and Keir Starmer, and I feel like you're, al- you're almost waiting for Keir Starmer to to finish boring everyone to death with whatever he's talking about. And then you're like, and then Stephen Flynn gets up and you're like, okay, so you're actually going to ask about the big political story of the week. Yeah. You're like, you, I, I know that you're actually going to talk about it, whether it's, I don't know, I can't think of an example off the top of my head, but. Um, well, he asked about strikes today, mm. which I thought was pretty important because, no, I mean, you'd think that if that many people had been, all of those junior doctors had been going on strike and it hadn't even been mentioned really in the House of Commons, you'd think that was something you would bring to the dispatch box and ask the Prime Minister about. Like, you know, where, where are we on that waiting list, that seven million people waiting list, Prime Minister, rather than kind of doing like reading off compliments that the Home Affairs Select Committee have once written about you? Mr Speaker, it seems, it seems clear that the junior doctor's strike is causing serious risk of loss of life and certainly causing harm and pain to thousands of our constituents. The first line of Hippocratic Oath is first do no harm. When does the Prime Minister think the BMA abandoned this central tenet of their profession? We value the work of junior doctors and are keen to find a fair and reasonable settlement which recognises their role and the wider economic context facing 
the UK. Uh, he's right to highlight the impact on patient safety, and that's why this government has brought forward minimum safety legislation to ensure that patients can rely on a core level of emergency service to protect vital patient care. That's something that we on this side of the House support, but I know is not something that's supported by the party opposite. It's just bollocks. It's complete bollocks. Um, to try and pin... OK, so let, if, let's say there are any negative health outcomes as a result of these strikes. And to be fair, there probably will be because of delayed operations, etc. Um, that being said, the junior doctors do, in emergency situations when there's a lack of capacity, they, there are derogations. They do leave the picket line and they do go into work when, when they're asked to. Minimum, stand, minimum safety levels are maintained. But David Davis has kind of jumped the shark and he's blaming the junior doctors as if they basically sent an email to the government yesterday to say, just to let you know, we're going to go on strike tomorrow for four days. Mm. Good luck. That is not how this works. Um, there is legislation in place that means at a minimum after the union has balloted and got a yes vote, they have to wait for at least a week before they can actually go on strike. In reality, it takes much longer because you're talking about literally half of the doctors in the country. It is not... He, he's pretending as if the government didn't know that these strikes were going to happen. It is not the junior doctor's responsibility to come up with an offer. They have one. They know what they want. It's 35% of their pay. They want restoration to their pay to 2008 levels. Steve Barclay has not come back to them with a counter offer. So for Steve Barclay to say, Steve Barclay is the one who's driving a hard, hard bargain here. He's the one who's saying, I'm not going to come up with a counter offer to you until you come down from 35%. He is the one who is stonewalling. He is the one who's not sitting down. I think he's met the BMA twice during, during this process. If, if, if the government was so concerned about the 500 people that are dying every week waiting for emergency A&E care, if the government was so concerned about the 7.3 million people who are on NHS waiting lists, they'd get around the fucking table and do a deal with the junior doctors. But they haven't. But they haven't. And it is deeply disingenuous to suggest that it's the junior doctors who are responsible for any of the negative outcome, health outcomes that come out as a result of this, because it's not their fault. Mm. And also, it's impossible for them to serve, uh, solve the conditions, issues that the mm. junior doctors have put on the table. Issues like staffing levels, not enough people being on shift, not enough doctors to tend to a ward. I mean, we were down at the pickets in various locations in London, and doctors were explaining that sometimes they don't feel they can provide adequate patient care. They don't think it's safe sometimes for patients because the wards are so sparse. And that's a longer term plan. That's, you know, the country needs to train or... Um, Retain. You retain more doctors, and that's kind of like a 10 year plan when the Tories are operating in two week, you know, mm. revolutions. Thanks very much for watching that video all the way to the end. And if you liked it, I've got some better news for you. Politics Joe is in the process of launching a podcast live in a couple of weeks' time. It's called The Pubcast. Link below, probably somewhere in the comments or the description, something like that. Check it out. Subscribe so you get ready for our first episode. It's coming soon. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts, Apple, Spotify, or any of those other slightly weirder platforms. See you soon.